Hello and welcome. My name is Asaf and I'm here with Mr. Pirashana Tevaraja, who is the Carnatic multi-percussionist and quanacolist. Pirashana, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. Oh, thank you. Great to be here. Uh, Pirashana, I wanted to start uh, with your beginnings, how you started uh, playing music, uh, where are you from? I know you play many, many instruments. I, I, I know that also most pe uh, percussionists that I know, more, most South Indian percussionists that I know, play a few instruments, but I know that you basically almost play all of them. So if you can speak That's about right. how, <laughs> if you can speak about uh, how you, you got to play so many instruments, uh, Carnatic yeah. that is, and uh, how, how you studied, where, where did it all start for you? Well, it kind of all started, I mean, I started formally learning the Mridangam when I was uh, about nine, I think. Yeah, I was about nine. Uh, my guru, uh, Shriyam Balachandra, who teaches at the Bharadvidya Bhavan, he's, he's my guru and has been my guru, uh, and is still my guru. Um, so I started learning from him formally, uh, properly. But before that, my brother used to play Mridangam, so I used to like listen to him play. So, so when I started learning, it wasn't an alien sound for me. It was right. something that I was, the sounds that I was familiar with. And was this in uh, London or was this in India? This was in London. This was in London. Okay. And I was born and brought up in London. Um, and my family are from Sri Lanka. So like a lot of Southeast Asian parents, music is probably one of the easiest things to kind of, uh, I don't know, teach your kids so that they don't uh, lose touch with their culture. Uh, I think that's something that's uh, probably one of the main reasons why a lot of Southeast Asian children learn uh, classical art forms or anything like that. So, yeah, I started learning. Um, I was one of his first students, um, definitely the longest lasting student. <laughs> um, so I think he, because he kind of started, we, and I was one of his first students, we, I think we definitely shared a special relationship. Like our class wasn't, my class wasn't just like, I go for an hour and then I come back. It was, uh, it started off like, I'll at least spend like a couple of hours uh, per set, per session. I was used to go two, two, three, two, twice a week. And then when I started doing the courses, like the diploma courses, it, I started going two to three times a week. And you know, it got to a point where he was, he would just tell my parents, just, just leave him, just drop him off in the morning and come and pick him up in the evening. So I ended up like, it was like a nine to five for me, but on the weekends. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I think I, uh, definitely, you know, those initial like six, seven years played a huge role in my, in my learning. Yeah. Well doing the, uh, uh, so much time, so much time with a teacher, yeah, yeah, yeah. spending so yeah. much time practicing with someone who is yeah, proficient. So he would, Exactly. So he would have other students and I would be sitting somewhere in a corner, like just practicing what he taught me or, or listening to things that he saw me to listen to. Um, and then how did I move on to the other instruments? Well, my teacher started playing, you know, we, there was always a lot of concerts happening in temples and, you know, small programs happening. So he would play Mridangam and my, actually, in it, you know, I'll tell you a funny story. My brother would play Kanjira. And then there was another senior student of my teachers who played Gatam. And at that time, there, wasn't, there weren't any more sings. He didn't have access to any more sings. Um, and I was actually quite young, so he, didn't, he wasn't too keen on giving me more sings so soon. I actually started playing castanets with him. Castanets? Uh, yeah, castanets. So it was not the traditional <laughs> way. It, it's really funny. Um, so I keep it in one hand and go... Like accompany him basically. So Upapakadim would be Ganjira, Gatam, and Castanet. So that kind of happened for for almost probably almost a year. And then I think my, my teacher went to India, he he brought some more things back with him, and then he kind of gave it to me. He said, Okay, this is the technique, just you know, use what you know and start playing the nades or whatnot. And then from that then I, I, you know, dabbled with Kanjura as well. I dabbled with the Gatam. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just my main, my main instrument was the Mridangam. And um, then I started, you know, just kind of picking up the other instruments as well. Yeah. So yeah. 
from the times that we were playing together i uh, i know that uh, there you you make a point out of uh, being also a conacolist and about certain style of uh, of uh, singing a uh, conacol uh, which i think you yeah. refer that the foreign style at some point far <laughs> <laughs> um actually i think it's because i i kind of got into listening to a lot of a lot of uh i was listening to a lot of music when i was young And that definitely influenced me. I, you know, I started listening to a lot of Vicu Vinayakaram, which then led me on to listening to a lot of Zakir Hussain, which then led me on to listening to Shakti. Where, and then, you know, I used to listen to, you know, there was a lot of Konakol there, you know. Um, and then I would listen to Vicu Vinayakaram's brother, T.H. Shubhas Chandran, who was a huge, you know, Konakol artist. Um, and then, you know, one thing would lead to the other. So I was just, I was just listening to a lot, 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 lot of, uh, musicians. And I think that really helped me kind of gain an interest in, in, in Konoko. Mm -hmm. And, um, and obviously our, our tradition is, it's an oral tradition. So whatever you learn, you have to be able to say, um, so, you know, all that together kind of, uh, made me interested in Konoko. Yeah. And yeah, it wasn't actually till... Quite later on that I actually started performing Konakol on stage so but it was something that I kind of kept doing or practicing so yeah it became part of my repertoire I guess yeah could you explain the listeners maybe the people who are not uh, versed in that Carnatic uh, style of music what is the role of Konakol what is it and what is it for you as well well the basic role is it's it's the kind of language of communication between uh, percussionists or between teacher and student, uh, between, not even percussionists, between musicians. Mm -hmm. Like if they want to teach, uh, uh, discuss a rhythm, they are, uh, I don't know, um, something like, uh, so they would say that. And then you would either, a, a disciple will either play it or um, another musician will be, oh, but you can say, Mm -hmm. You know, you can kind of double it up. So it's it's a kind of uh, language that is used to communicate, I guess, between musicians about yes. music. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, you know, Konakol is becoming. Uh, it's kind Ooh. of a little bit. <laughs> no, it's kind of becoming. It's a little bit unclear at the moment, but it's you know there are some people. Uh, like Konakol, Sumashaka, Joyce, and Manjula BC oh, that fabulous. are propagating this art form as an independent yeah. art form. And I yeah. really like that. And I, I mean, hats off to both of them for what they're doing for Konakol. It's Absolutely. really inspiring and they've really, they really have taken it to another level. Yeah, um, yeah. I absolutely so, agree yeah. with that. And they both, they both were on the show. And, and they're uh, both fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Amazing musicians. Yeah, and people, yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And, you know, one of the instruments that you play, you mentioned earlier on, the morsing. Yeah. So, most people uh, have not really seen uh, South Indian morsing, what, what, what it is. But I, I really like this instrument also in the connection in contact with the conical. Because, you know, as you said, it's like, it's like conical made into a melody almost, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So could you, could you speak a little bit about that instrument and its relationship to conical, how it is related? Okay, so this, this, can you see that? Yeah, this is the Morsing. It's small, uh, but can be very dangerous because this, this bit is quite sharp. And, the, you know, the first thing I was told when, I was, uh, when my teacher gave me the Morsing was, be careful, you can cut your tongue. I was like, great, that's a great start, you know. Um, <laughs> so when you say, when you play uh, Morsing, you have to actually roll your tongue back and like, like that and say the, say the syllables. Okay. The relationship with conical, Morsing is probably 90 to 95% conical. Because mm -hmm. if you're not say, saying the syllables, you're not going to get much variations between, besides just plucking and uh, maybe inhalation, exhalation. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it is uh, very largely based on, uh, you know, on conical. Could you give us a, like a simple example of how sure. conical can translate to uh, a mel melody on the... Morsing? Sure. So let's start simple.
Takradam, the Takradam, Tati Takradam. So, you know, it is it is all, you know, without conical morsing would be very difficult to play. Yeah, it's interesting. It's like you're doing it, you are I'm I'm hearing you're doing it, and I'm here like an I'm hearing it almost like an echo of just like a distant conical. Obviously you're yeah. you're you're actually doing the conical, but with with, with your tongue. I mean, though we use a lot of conical for morsing, uh, because of the way the instrument is kept in the mouth and how you have to roll your tongue back and how you can't use your voice, we, a lot of the times we kind of use the shape of the tongue to uh, uh, kind of bring out syllables. So when I'm saying something like, what I'm actually saying, uh, what I'm actually saying when I'm playing the morsing is, because I can't let my tongue out. So, so for, for kind of more, uh, for notes with more attack, I would use a, a T, like a T, T. And for softer notes, I'll use a Ch, like a Ch kind of sound. So, so those are kind of you know that's those are the kind of adaptations you make to to play the more sing and using you know conical to play more sing if you listen to very very old old recordings uh of more sing artists you sometimes you can actually hear them hear their voices uh like i'm talking about recordings from like the 50s or 60s you can actually you know like the old recordings where there's just one mic recording everyone. You can actually hear the voice of the, uh, the, the, uh, the Morsing artists, yeah. And did you, uh, do you get to, to use this uh, instrument very, uh, very much? I know that you, you, know, you play all over the world, you, know, you play regularly for a long time with uh, Anushka Shankar, yeah. and uh, um, but also with so many other people. Do you get a chance actually, to play this? Yes, because um, if I'm not playing, if I'm not asked to play Mridang, the second most popular instrument I'm asked to play is the Morsing because oh, okay. there there aren't many Morsing players in, in the UK. Mm. There's of course um, Sri Stumbernathan who plays, he's been there since forever. Um, and then he plays professionally and um, yeah, I, I kind of play Morsing professionally as well. So when someone needs Morsing, it's either myself or him that get the call. <laughs> so on a classical stage for Upa Pakawadiam, I get to play Morsing a lot. Yeah. I've played Morsing for a lot of uh, recordings and soundtracks and stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I do, I do get to play quite often. Yeah. And could you tell us a little bit about, uh, talking about your collaboration with other artists, about uh, what you've been doing lately? As again, as, as I mentioned, you're, you're regularly playing with uh, Nushka Shankar, but I know that yeah. you're doing a lot of other things too. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I play a, a lot with uh, Anishka. I was playing with her father before that, till um, till his last years. Um, we actually, I just finished. We just finished a tour in India. Um, that was kind of the last gig we did uh, until till everything got cancelled. <laughs> okay. um, so you are there so, yeah, now. we just finished. I mean, I'm still in India. Yeah. Um, so I just uh, we just finished a tour. We were actually supposed to do a lot of concerts in c- celebration of uh, Pandit Ravi Shankar's hundredth year anniversary, but every everything got cancelled, uh, or not cancelled, but postponed actually, sure. um, because of uh, what's going on. Um, other than that, I've I've, uh, I've recently started working with uh, the dancer Akram Khan as well. Um, thanks to uh, B C Manjunath who introduced me to him. Um, uh, so if, if there is an all clear to travel and perform and all that, then I should be working with him in the autumn. Uh, and then there are, you know, some classical concerts happening in UK and Europe. So I'll be kind of busy with those as well. So yeah, you know, keeping busy. And are you, uh, are you teaching at all? Do you have, uh, do you have a time within your uh, uh, traveling schedule? (laughs) No, I haven't actually. I, I tried, but I I just couldn't stick to regular classes because traveling kind of took over. It's funny because I I become free and then I'm like, you know what? Okay. I'm going to teach for a bit. The moment I start teaching then I'm like, oh, you know what? I have to take next week off because I'm traveling or I've got rehearsals. 
So I've kind of put a, uh, a pause on teaching for the moment um, because I, ju I just, I honestly, I just can't um, uh, stick to regular classes. Yeah. And I feel bad if I, if I don't do that. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Prashana, can, you, can we speak a little bit more about Conacol and about some compositions we were speaking earlier? Sure. About uh, uh, any compositions like uh, uh, some simple corvais or simple uh, compositions that you can uh, show us. It'll be nice also to see how they sound on the morsing as well. Sure. Uh, one thing I like doing with Conacol, I'm... I'll be honest with you, I'm not that much of a mathematical person, I'm more of a musical person. So sure. even, even in concerts, I kind of latch on to phrasings and uh, you know, intonations and accents and stuff more than the actual numbers. So you know, I, I, a lot of my playing is based around kind of grooves and all that kind of, you know, uh, kind of feel than actual mathematics. We can start with you know, the regular taka dimi taka juno and how we can kind of Give variations on that. So, So, I mean, as I was saying this, I remembered that I think a lot of my intonations have been have I've kind of imbibed subconsciously by listening to a lot of Jeh Subhash Chandra. Yeah. Cuz I remember when all of YouTube kind of started when every you know everyone started you know watching YouTube videos. I think his were probably one of the first videos that started coming up on YouTube. So I was mm. you know a lot of them were kind of on on loop <laughs> for me. Um so yeah, I mean um you know going from Conical being something that I, a, a learning tool to something of, of an art form or a performance tool, um, I kind of learned the difference through watching a lot of his videos, yeah. Yeah. One thing I remember, coming back to one thing I remember you mentioning once when we played uh, together, uh, is about the Farans or the Farans style of Conical. Yeah. So first of yeah. all, uh, I, I'm sure a lot of my uh, viewers don't know at all what is Farans. And maybe you can show show them what is a Farans, and then maybe uh, show them a Farans style type of uh, conical. So Farans is basically uh, rolling syllables, mm -hmm. uh, fast rolling syllables. So so that that would come under that would be Farans. So so in a, in a Tani Artnam, before you play the Mohra, you play something called the Farans. Which is all rolling, rolling syllables. So that would probably sound like a dum, Beautiful. So it's all those like kind of rolling syllables is uh, yeah. is what Farance is basically. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a uh, something that you play before before the main composition. Before you're going into the more of the yeah. percussion solo, the Tanya yeah. Vatana. That's right. That's right. Great. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Great. And is there any uh, any other uh, rhythmic compositions you can share? Something I've kind of recently <coughs> got into is is um, actually from the Pakowaj tradition. Oh, okay. Is saying shlokas in in the in the rhythmic uh, in the rhythmic style. 
Mm -hmm. um, so there's one beautiful one that I learned from a recording of the Pukawaji one, Bhavani Shankar. Mm -hmm. um, it's in Mishranade. so this is something I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm trying to get more material. Um, it's a bit difficult because a lot of my fr a friend of mine said you have to go to Banaras and you know a lot of the tabla players there will have it, um, which I haven't really made a trip to yet. But you know, I'd like to and uh, something that I'd like to explore a lot more of. Yeah, yeah. beautiful. And uh, just for general information, the pakawaj is uh, is it a North Indian uh, 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 instrument? It is. It is not a Hindustani instrument. Hindustani. It's um, it's older than the tabla, I think, mm -hmm. and it's it's used more for drupad, yes. uh, the drupad, drupad style of singing. And it's yeah, quite a massive music. sound. It's like really, it's really a big, a huge, open, huge sound. Very open, uh, very uh, yeah, long, sustained, isn't it? Very yeah, very royal, um, bold sound, open mm -hmm. sound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the other word that you use, the shloka, which is like a rhythmic song, isn't it? Shloka is rhythmic song. I guess that's one way of putting it. Uh, I mean, shlokas and mantras, they're all kind of like a science by itself, you know. You know, it's in Sanskrit and there's a lot of, uh, that's a whole other kind of uh, ball game, uh, you know, and people still doing research on, on that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, rhythm, songs, I guess, in, in praise um, of any particular deity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So quite religious yeah. context. Very, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they're very particular about pronunciation. Yeah. Uh, because like one little change can, you know, change the whole meaning of the whole thing and it could, yeah. you know, it's be completely wrong. So. Are shlokas uh, always tied into uh, this particular style of music, the drupad? It's kind of all over uh, Indian classical music. Um, because, I mean, Indian classical music is very, uh, I don't want to say religious, but more spiritual. So, um, you know, the people, you can sing a shloka, you can recite a shloka, uh, you know, you can make a song out of it. It's, you know, many different ways of treating it. Yeah, it's a beautiful uh, form of uh, Indian music. I would definitely recommend, recommend anyone who's yeah. uh, listening now I mean, to, to go ahead to, and check. Sometimes. Sometimes I used to uh, like go, like visiting temples just to hear the priests recite uh, yeah. mantras and shlokas because I just found it some I just found it very musical mm. um, and very percussive. I think that's probably why I was attracted to it. But from a young age, I was really really attracted to you know priests reciting mantras and stuff. Yeah. So it maybe that's why I was kind of drawn to you know the pakawaj farm and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, the pakawaj yeah. is a, such a beautiful instrument, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I remember seeing a, a Drupad concert that went for about three and a half hours with non-stop. Wow, yeah. It's just and a couple of ragas. Performed, what, two, two pieces, two, three pieces Yeah, a couple most. of ragas, that's it. That's two songs. <laughs> it, yeah. yeah, it's just the way they explore something, it's, it's so beautiful and, yeah. you know, and so slow as mind well. Mind-blowing. Yeah. So they take their time. Yeah, yeah. it's very mind-blowing and mindful as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me, what are your plans at the moment? Obviously, you're you're, you're sitting at home because uh, we all <laughs> have to. But plans uh, at the moment, I, I honestly don't know. Um, you know, I'm kind of spending time with family. Uh, you know, trying to keep my my little one entertained is taking most part of the day. Yeah. Um, your instrument is you don't have your instrument with you, unfortunately. Uh, the Merlano, yeah. yeah? It's, it's at it's at the. Um, the repair it's gone for repair because the black parts have all fallen out yeah. and i need some heads changed so yeah i don't have my mridangas with me but um you know good thing about percussion is we can play anywhere yeah. so, <laughs> and you don't need I mean, for conical you don't need an instrument isn't it exactly it's a conical or kanjira is there or, you know play a little bit on the morsing yeah uh, just 
tap on my knees, tap on the table. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of musicians out there have been putting a lot of material during this period, which is lovely to kind of watch and learn as well. Yes. Uh, so yeah, I just that's what I've been doing. Well, uh, Pirashana, thank you so much for for your time and uh, for sharing uh, with us your uh, your uh, hi- uh, history and your knowledge. I really appreciate uh, it. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you again soon. Yeah, hopefully you play together soon. As play well. together again, yeah, soon in London or, or in India. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Asa. Thank you.